You've probably played that game when you ask some of your friends, if you had to go live on a desert island, what would you take with you? On a day like today, when it's hot, you don't want to think about a desert island, so make it an Arctic island. Suppose you were going to live on an Arctic island, Sorrel's Bend, Friends Joseph Land. What would you take with you? Assuming that you had a place to stay that would keep you warm when you needed to be warm. The first thing the Buddha re would recommend would be that you make sure that your island gets above the flood. It's not going to be overcome by rising sea levels. In his image, it's the the establishing of mindfulness. You focus on the body in and of itself. You put aside all thoughts of greed and distress with reverence to the world. Just you right here with your body. And you're ardent, alert, and mindful. Notice the order there, ardent. It's the ardency that makes everything skillful there. Because mindfulness can simply be keeping anything in mind, or alertness can watch yourself, or the, as you are alert, you watch yourself doing anything, and it would count as alertness. But when you do this well, when you do it in a way that would give rise to concentration, that's the function of ardency, and that's what makes the other two skillful. You are mindful for the purpose of right concentration. You are alert for the purpose of right concentration. to remember what needs to be done. You put aside all thoughts of sensuality and just focus on the form of the body. If you're going to look for happiness, you look for happiness here. You explore the breath. What way of breathing is refreshing to the body, strengthening the body. Explore. Try to develop a sense of ease, a sense of coolness. And if you're feeling oppressed by the heat, try to gladden your mind. What things would make you glad right now? Things in line with the drama. If you get fascinated by the breath, You can tell yourself, it doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. I've got something really interesting to play with right here. You're alone on your Arctic island, but you've got a fascinating toy, one that has infinite variety. You can play with the breath going down the body as you breathe, you can play with it coming up the body as you breathe. I found at times when your back feels weak from sitting too much, it's good to think of the breath energy coming up as you're breathing, coming up from the soles of your feet, up your legs, up the spine, up over the head. But don't get it stuck in the head, think of it coming back down again through the torso, the front of the torso. But you play around, see what works for you. And as you're established here, you've got three of the frames of mindfulness right away. Body, feelings, mind. And as you, your ardency keeps working, then you develop dhammas as well, particularly the dhammas of the practice for awakening. So you've got all four together right here. This is your island. This is what keeps you safe from the flood. And then you want to make sure that you've got good treasures. Treasures that will stick with you all the time. Because the purpose of this kind of contemplation is to ask yourself, well, what's really worthwhile? What can you take with you when you go? When you really go, when you, to leave not only 
this spot on earth, but also this spot in your body. This is where the Buddha recommends seven treasures. The first is conviction. You realize that you have verbal actions and mental actions and bodily actions. And you're convinced, in line with what the Buddha taught, is that you actually choose your actions. Your freedom of choice is not an illusion. And your actions do have consequences based on the goodness of your heart or the lack of goodness. That's an empowering thought right there. You wonder why people having this opportunity to act and speak and think and choose good actions would want to throw away the possibility that they have any choice. In some cases, because they don't like the idea of responsibility. But it really limits them. As the Buddha keeps saying, there are lots of areas in life where you can't prove anything before you've practiced. Whether nibbana is possible or not, whether you really do have control of your actions. But why choose an the option that limits your possibilities? As long as you don't know for sure, be open to whichever hypothesis gives you more possibilities. It's not your first treasure. Seeing that your actions do have value, and you want to make the best of them. Based on that, you develop a sense of shame, you develop a sense of compunction, both of which basically tell you two things that are skillful. They reinforce the lessons of heedfulness. Shame with a sense of you think of the people you admire, and you would like to look good in their eyes. Whatever values you picked up from them, you want to measure yourself by those values, and you'd be ashamed to drop them or work below them. Compunction is when you simply realize your actions will have consequences, and why go to the effort of doing something that's going to lead to suffering down the line? makes no sense at all. So based on your shame and compunction, there's the treasure of virtue. You decide to abstain from anything that's harmful. You remember that the virtues of the precepts are also positive. In addition to not killing, you are gentle and kind with living beings. In addition to not stealing, you help people protect their possessions. Same with not engaging in illicit sex. You develop the virtue of restraint. You learn to look for your pleasures in other areas, aside from sensuality. In addition to not telling lies, you actually are truthful, open about your, your mistakes so that you can learn from what other people might have to give in terms of their recommendations. Find with intoxicants, get the virtue there, you avoid intoxicants, and you stay heedful. So learn how to think of Virtue not simply as abstaining from harm, but also positively doing good. And it's a treasure of generosity. You make a habit of being generous not only with material things, but also with your, your energy, your knowledge, your time. You broaden your mind. You make your mind more spacious. You're not just here grubbing and grabbing things. You see that you have something that other people can use with benefit, and you're happy to share it with them. That creates, as I said, a spacious mind state. And as John Lee points out, you make the whole world your home. Wherever you've been generous, that becomes part of your home. Wherever you've been generous, your relatives were the people there.
one of the very first studies that established the field of anthropology was on the, the act of giving. And one of the things that the anthropologists noted was that you take down barriers when you give a gift. When you have to have something paid for, you're erecting a barrier. Because giving is something basically you do within the family. And when you give something to somebody outside the family, you're basically making them part of your family. This is why in Thailand monks refer to lay people as their relatives, especially when their, their supporters are their relatives. And why there's a sense of family around any healthy monastic community. Because we're tearing down barriers, and as I said, you're making your mind more spacious, your sense of the world as a place where you belong, where it's your home, where you have relatives wherever you go. That's the treasure of generosity. Then there's the treasure of learning. Here, of course, we're talking about learning the Dhamma. You try to listen to what the Buddha had to say, get his advice not only in terms of abstract teachings, but also his advice in terms of the analogies he gives. Because as you know, the way you shape your experience is through how you breathe, how you talk to yourself, and then the perceptions and feelings you focus on. And the Buddha gives you advice on all of those. We're born into this world without without much advice on how to breathe. Nobody tells us how to breathe, unless you become an athlete or become a singer. And even then, the lessons in breathing may not be the best for the health of the body. Here the Buddha is teaching you, this is how you breathe, this is how you talk to yourself. The analogies he gives in the canon are his advice on what perceptions to hold in mind, the perceptions that will give rise to thoughts of goodwill, the perceptions that help give rise to, thoughts of endurance, the ability to endure, how to talk to yourself when things are difficult. These are the Buddha's gifts. And so as you take his gifts, you make yourself wealthy in, in terms of knowledge. Then there's finally discernment. There's a discernment that comes from listening to what the Buddha had to say. But then you build on that, you start thinking things through. You ask yourself, what is there in the, the Dhamma that I have trouble accepting? How do I fit the different teachings together so they make the most sense? This is where you bring qualities of truth and your powers of observation and your goodwill to the teaching. There are a lot of people out there who listen to the Dharma trying to find fault. If you look at a lot of the teachings of modern Dharma teachers, and it seems like they hate the Dharma. Their first reaction always is, well, we're going to change this to suit ourselves. And they're missing out that the fact that the Buddha is giving you really good advice in the areas of where you find that it goes against your sense of self or your sense of the world. The Buddha is challenging you after all. He's telling you, your sense of self in the world is a state of becoming. We're trying to get past becoming. Wherever there's becoming, there's going to be suffering. And so even though you may have a strong sense that your idea of what yourself is and what the world is, it is reality, he asks you to be truthful about the fact, well, where did you get these ideas? And what are you you're basing your decision that you're going to take them as working hypotheses, because there's so many things in our worldviews that are not things that we really know. We just take them on, because we like them, because they make sense. But then if they make sense in a way that gets in the way of our ability to put an end to suffering, why adopt those views? So you look at 
where you got the ideas, you look at your motivation for wanting to hold on to them. Is it something really honorable? Or is there some greed, aversion, and delusion in there? And then when you hold on to these views, what kind of actions do they inspire? Do they actually inspire you to act in skillful ways? If you believe, for instance, that everything is determined by material laws, physical laws, what impetus is there to go to the trouble of trying to be skillful? And again, you're abandoning your, your power to choose your actions and shape your life. So from the discernment that comes from reading and listening, there comes the discernment that comes from thinking things through. Then when you think things through in the proper way, you develop a desire to put them into practice. And then you develop the, the discernment that comes from actually trying to get the mind to settle down, actually trying to get the mind to be one with the breath, trying to develop all of the factors of the path. Even the right view leads the way. It gets trained by actually following through with these factors of the path. So all the factors of the path support one another. Since your discernment gets trained, your discernment gets trained by your right mindfulness and your right effort and your right concentration and all the other right factors. That's when it's strong. It's strong enough to see through to what the real treasure is that the Buddha taught, which is there is this deathless dimension in the mind. And how do you find it? Well, by developing these treasures. That's where they really are valuable. And the kinds of treasures you can take with you wherever you go, even when you leave this life. They're just part of your mind. You may forget specific Dharma teachings, but the habits that these treasures develop, those go with you. And when you encounter the Dharma again, it's like encountering an old friend. So when you think about your Arctic island, the island of mindfulness, this is what you take with you. To make sure that you not only stay safe from the flood, but you've got plenty of things to take you even further, because these are the treasures. You might say that they buy nirvana. It might be better to say, to say that you exchange them for nirvana, although the, the final result is that even when you attain nirvana, these things don't leave you. They're part of the mind as well. As long as the mind is still with this body, it's got these treasures to use. And they can share them with other people. That's the best kind of wealth there is. The wealth that doesn't create boundaries, the, cre the wealth that erases boundaries. And that the more you give to others, the more you have. <laughs>